first of all, this is being videotaped. Is anybody opposed to uh, videotaping? We'll put it on the web. So just to make sure you're okay. okay. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Lynette. She is, uh, she has been a practicing uh, painter for at least, what, 50 years? 40 years? Um, well, years? actually painting. Okay, and um, and she's uh, and her work is shown all over uh, Europe and the world, basically, and um, in bits, in bits, and pieces. <laughs> and I wanted you to uh, get a sense of what she was about and what it was about to be an artist, living as an artist for her whole life, which is kind of inspiring. So I wanted you to see that. Um, anyway, and then uh, so Lynette will talk for about forty minutes. Uh, her work will go on a slide, if it works, we'll go on a slide uh, sort of carousel moment. Uh, it'll be repeated a few times, maybe two or three times, to get a sense of her work. And um, then we'll have questions. Okay. okay. <coughs> so, uh, do you Good evening. <laughs> somehow got through life and will continue while life possesses her, as the Chinese say, earning a bad living with brush and pen. Professor Golding asked me to talk to you, and sorry, I have to read this, but you can ask me questions. I couldn't just talk with a few notes. One needs experience for that. I consider myself fortunate to be one of the generation who went to art school when drawing. The training of the hand and eye and coordination was considered important. The reason being that once you had enough control so that you could represent something accurately, you then had more real control over whatever else you were attempting to do. I'm not really sure of the reasons for the reaction against that theory. It was certainly seen as academic and therefore bad and also restricted. The idea was, I think, that if you got rid of it, you would somehow free up the student into a more valuable sort of self-expression, and that once you got fixed in the academic mire, you were stuck in it, and you could never be free. Maybe I should quote Dryden here, only the educated are free. That does not take account of people like me, who find themselves in both senses in the old tradition, and who are deeply unhappy if forced to deny what was and is natural to them. It's because of this that I'm here. I feel strongly that there are students who have been and still are denied an aspect of whatever it is we call art, simply because the establishment of the day has decided that it is of doubtful value. Ordinary people throng to exhibitions where it is obvious that drawing in the traditional eye is a springboard, and yet the power group still has, it seems to me, a real dislike of what is seen as merely historicist, and that we should all want to leave that old world behind with all its mystery, beauty, and emotion, and become whatever it is that is deemed to be acceptable. In my own art school, now Central St. Martin's, I have heard that there is no lifelong income class incorporated into the fine art degree. Life drawing is a separate add-on. I have also heard of students organizing classes for themselves, which implies that they feel deprived. According to the curriculum, which we downloaded, um, the fine art degree is to be compared with other ac academic degrees, for example, um, philosophy and sociology. Painting within the fine art context does not include drawing as far as I can see though it is included in the foundation year, and a part-time year is not enough. I'm always hearing the words challenging work, an expression of approval applied to art which is non-representation. Of course, there are thousands of amateur painters and hundreds of professionals like me who have willfully continued in figurative work. They get by, possibly by teaching the private sector, and some do earn a decent living just selling their work as an illustration. But as recently as it is 1989, in this very art school, I understand that figurative painting was actually banned. I was sent the link to an interview with a student at that time who said that people started obediently to do dribble paintings. I'm glad to say the ban was later lifted, and it's possible to be kind and say that it was born of a romantic dream, 
to me, it smacks of totalitarianism, communist China, Russia, Hitler, Germany, etc. I can only compare it to expecting dancers to be able to perform without training, only from the rigorous discipline of daily classes, that fine tuning of the body which is so necessary to develop good technique, can the dancer interpret a part, a character, an emotion without injury. For musicians, it's the same. The legendary 10,000 hours are a requirement, not a legend. You cannot just pick up a violin and play it, or a saxophone, or anything. For singers, living with that wild beast which is the voice that has to be protected and cosseted, it's a little different, but an untrained voice can be ruined. Technique has to be learned and the work done. I think that we in the visual arts are lucky. We can start again, scrape it off, use my paint, knock down the clay, switch off the computer. The live performance artist is always a hostage to fortune on the day when they have to connect with the composer, their own bodies, and the audience. But we too have to connect. There has to be something in what we produce, unless purely conceptual, which is more than what might be called the sum of its parts. All of you, if you're serious, will know that you feel it. You can't define it, but you recognize it when you have a good day or when you see a piece of work which imposes itself, leaves a bit of itself on the retina, and you want to go back and look again. It's infinitely subtle, but you can recognize it. I have to return now to what made me want to get on the train, come and talk to, or read to. Professor Golding wants me to talk about my work, and I will. But there are questions that I think we all need to consider, arising from the state of the art world today, whatever art is. A teacher friend suggests that I substitute cre human creativity. I still prefer art, even if ambiguous. I think here I throw in one dictionary de definition of art. The two <coughs> volumes short of Oxford of around 1960, which is roughly about the beginning of the time of change in art schools that I'm highlighting, gives the following. Skill, the result of knowledge, practice, learning, science, the application of skill for some to the taste, as poetry, music, etc. An occupation in which skill is used to gratify taste or produce what is beautiful. There's a lot more, but that'll do. Then we go to fine art. The arts which are concerned with the beautiful or which appeal to taste, often restricted to the arts of design, painting, sculpture, architecture. Then, and I like this almost as an afterthought, of poaching and parliamentary obstruction. We can go off on that track, but not now. So my springboard is the concept of art involving skill, and beauty, and emotion. There has been, until relatively recently, in many art schools, the idea of the, that the acquiring of skill, the previously necessary training in hand operation, could somehow be bypassed, and that by avoiding what many saw as dull and time-consuming, a great leap to a sort of creative nirvana could be accomplished. And this, I have to say, is a crazily deluded and romantic notion. There may be a few students who have such great built-in talent that they can go straight to whatever they want to do, a metaphorical flight over the nitty-gritty, the times, tables, and scales of being an artist in its old sense. Interestingly enough, apart from not wanting to formally teach children to read, other crazy delusions of the time included the feeling that the teaching of anatomy in medical schools was not that important. A medical friend told me about this, which fortunately for all of us did not pass. It was realized that surgeons needed to learn anatomy by dissection, not just by looking at the wonderful drawings in Gray's Anatomy or a TV screen. Demonstrators in anatomy, known as demons, and elderly surgeons, were therefore dragged out of retirement just in time. Uh, you know, we need to think about that. Um, we should not forget that in the past, artists also did the section. And the pre raphaelite Holman Hunt boiled down a horse a bit at a time to get at the skeleton. Apparently the stench was awful and Mrs. Hunt was not pleased. So return to whatever art is, what it has become, how it is perceived, what is it, what's expected of it. Like a lot of people who work alone, I'm not aware of enough of what is going on around me. I don't go to enough exhibitions of modern work. But when I do, I feel that I'm some sort of alien being. That world is nothing to do with me, and the only way to hang on to 
to any sort of self-esteem or sanity is to go back to the studio, get on with it, and try to remember that some perfectly sensible people have paid far down in life than I do. On a bad day, the old freelance sense wins. I've fooled some of the people up till now, but now I have found out, and no one will ever pay me for anything again. Everything I have done seems somehow silly, and my eye is too developed for my own good. I only see the flaws, and it is hard to find an a state of equilibrium, and I'm not alone in that. And I'm sure lots of you know that feeling. Why should this be? Pendulum swing and fashion is as fickle as always, but it is only in the visual arts that what was once the norm, the basic assumptions which have been part of our culture for hundreds of years, and they've become something to, to suppress. The wish to remain a part of that culture is unacceptable. Or in my case, simply being a part of it, I had no choice, it was natural to me. Had I tried to please, I would simply have produced bad pastiche, and what would have been the point of that? The stubborn child won anyway, and I don't think I could even do pastiche. I was a poorly educated young person. I didn't have the verbal tools to defend myself until middle age. The prevailing winds of the art establishment grew stronger as time passed, and certainly not blowing in favor of those like me. I remember a well-meaning friend putting me next to a gallery owner at a supper party. I told him what I did and was told in return, oh, we don't have time for all that these days. Art had moved on, I was a dinosaur. I'd heard all the arguments about what art should be, that there was an ongoing revolution of socio-political needs, and that somehow our art should undermine capitalist structures, be shocking, all of that. Anything else not being relevant to the needs of our times. I've tried to analyze this, probably too simply, but I think there is a fear of beauty and emotion. Maybe it would be more correct to say that the fear is more of striving after beauty and fame. In music, it can show us avoidance of melody and harmony. Uh, but the serialists went off and made esoteric noises. But there's no sign of anything being banned. Why should this be? If we are mostly dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants, that's how it's always been. Our own struggles will always be disheartening if we compare ourselves with past genius. When artists of the late 19th into the early 20th century, Picasso, Bra, German Expressionist, Duchamp, Kandinsky, um, the list, list is endless, chose to avoid comparisons with what had gone before and look for something new and different. A great many perfectly healthy babies got chucked out with bath water. But let us not forget that those artists had had the benefit of a grounding in drawing and they had brilliant technique. The new was combined with genius and I am not objecting to developments, choices, whatever, which have led to what we mostly see on gallery walls today. What I am asking is why there is such a very negative vibe when the establishment of today is faced with people like me who aren't safely dead. <laughs> but with the so I'll go. But with the so-called de-skilling, the concept has tended to be what matters most. And the concept, of course, has to be explained, thus giving work to art critics good for the industry, a happy symbiosis, and the concept itself can also make the visual aspect of the work redundant. A. A. Gill on the Sunday Times wrote recently that thanks to Duchamp, the big question of the 20th century in art was, what is art? His, Duchamp's, as a self-referential distrusting of craft. Whether their arguments be made to the point of sterility is the biggest question now facing the art world. I also quote from an essay by Will Self in the Guardian Review last year. Um, he refers to the conceptualists who, who he liked in the past, because by and large, they produce artworks which by their very nature demanded no actual aesthetic response, no eye as it's commonly understood, but only an intellectual one, a willingness to get the artwork as if it were a sight gag. I've never seen such a summing up before, and I found it interesting, and a bit chilly, but I'm glad he refers to his past. And he liked the young British artists because they gave such good parties. Here I have to say again that I've absolutely no wish to ban anything. If a light bulb switched on and off in a small dark space with hanging objects, TV mon uh, monitor, gobbledygooking over the sound of breaking waves or trains or gunfire, a loop of film, whatever, if it touches you and gives you something, then that means the creator has succeeded with you in 
that time and that place. But I am not remotely a part of that world. I don't respond to it, and I probably have the wrong genes. And I'm not alone. To answer search for the beautiful, the harmonious, to find the poetry in the subject and translate it into a two-dimensional piece of board, paper, or canvas is not a walk in the park. It's all a bit mad, really. But it shouldn't be the aim of an art educational establishment to try to educate that madness out of any student or substitute it with an academic course. All doors should remain open. If we accept that we are going to earn a professional salary, that life will always be uncertain, give or take a bit of part-time teaching or anything else to pay the bills, charity shops and grog ops rule, we should at least be able to try to be the best at what we are. It, it comes from within, and it's not just an exercise. Perhaps people go to art school now for different reasons. Past is past after all. But I do get the feeling that the system is at the same time more prescriptive and yet less demanding. I haven't said anything yet about the possible influence of photography and the reaction against figurative or realistic work. <coughs> the camera gave ordinary people the ability to pr produce images. Art, all those who saw themselves in charge of it, felt the need to go elsewhere. There was talk about the democratization of art. Technology gives the false promise that everyone can be an artist. Elite has become a naughty word. But just as there are elite athletes, athletes, and no one seems to mind that as a concept, so surely there are, and always have been, elite artists, dancers, and musicians, people whose talent and capacity to use it is way beyond what most of us can aspire to. Should we not be grateful for the dedication, for the years of drudgery very often? A few months ago, we went, my husband and I, went to the pre raphaelite exhibition in London. Valdemar Janoshek dandled them, the whole lot. Not worth one pusa, I think he said. Yet these were a group of serious, talented, possibly slightly bonkers young men whose dedication to their idea of what art should be was quite extreme, working on large canvases out of doors in order to translate nature as closely as possible before bringing them back into the studio to add their human characters. They did not rely on drawing pattern books. Their wives and lovers sat them. Some made money, some did not. But the commitment shown in the output is extraordinary. It makes the comment of the art world of now, written by people on my side of the fence, ring particularly true, and poverty of aspiration is one of them. I'm pleased to say the exhibition was full, time, tickets, the young and the old. And yes, the religiosity is not part of our world. It's hard to identify with the strength of religious feeling. But the storytelling, the passion and belief in what they were doing, and the beauty of some of the pieces and technical brilliance, place them fairly high up in the hierarchy of art in recent centuries. I think casual down-putting, common among critics, testifies to blindness, too much power, and a bad habit of mind. But Mr. Yanishak may be softened. In a recent column, he failed to admire some of fashion's recent darlings, and he loves for city Bas Barocci, who is a sweet and relatively unknown Italian. All establishments are conservative in the old sense, self-protective and rather rigid, and this one is no different. But in my lifetime, I have seen work which was previously dismissed as chocolate box start to fetch large sums in sale rooms. I hear that life drawing is coming back. I'm told there is a school of drawing in Bristol, and here am I talking to you. But we should not overemphasize the importance of light drawing, oral drawing, objects in relation to each other carefully observed is also important. Is art in the eye of the beholder? Possibly. And of course, the experience of education of the beholder counts for much. It can take a very long time for perceptions to change. It is a fact that art, until relatively recently, was dependent on patronage, above all from the church. Then came the rich and the royals who wanted the favor of the church, and God, of course, who would presumably be pleased with the wonderful decorations and paintings in the churches. With the overspill into private houses and palaces, we've been left an incredible heritage. It was down with East at Tiemble when asked about his secrets, presumably meaning technique, paints, etc., who said, above all, you need a good client, and was otherwise very unforthcoming. <laughs> I have to love Tiemble. 
The big client is now the state, and the state, being the main provider of education, controls the art schools, and therefore those who teach in them. We also have the Arts Council. Of the very few practitioners among its army of civil servants, even fewer are likely to be anything other than supporters of the status quo, and this must make it all the harder for the outsider to be considered. There are many who find the de-skilling or dislike of skill in art depressing. They shrug their shoulders, get on with life, buy a few pictures they like, but they know they won't get any kudos for so doing. I had a client who had nine of my paintings, and they were all kept upstairs. When he moved to the country, a few of them came down into more public view. I presume that it was a sort of secret price, safer kept away from the fashion piece. And before I get on to part two, with Professor Golding wants to say about me, maybe I should apologize for what seems like vampire. But the truth is that most educated people who reach adulthood in the last 30 to 40 years have actually been taught to be very, at best, suspicious of my kind of work, and that possibly sometimes your tutors. It is easier, if you are insecure and not particularly visually sensitive, to follow fashion, to put a few nice coloured splodges in tasteful frames on the wall. You will not be judged. Before I started writing this, I talked to a lot of people and made a lot of notes. And the question I continue to ask is why an aspect of creativity, so normal for hundreds of years, should actually be banned or at the least be discouraged in some art schools. This has not happened with literature. The purely experimental seldom works. And anyway, a good novel is still a good novel. I can only really say, follow your own, sorry, follow your own feelings and put your own, yourself into what you do. And it will always be better than being art directed. The development of children, the wish to draw, the depiction of the child's world and people in it follows a well-documented sequence. Drawing and painting tend to be encouraged. On what stage our doctor's approval of the wrong sort of drawing and painting is expressed, I don't know. A friend of mine was taught to do abstract drawings and fill them in color. She thinks at about 14. I can't help feeling that so much of what is acceptable invo involves rejection. And I think that we need to build again and without prejudice and stop rejecting the human and the world around us because that is what an, ex an obsession with abstraction leads to. And we hear much of the need to be inclusive. Learning to do anything well is often seen to be elitist, which is in turn seen as being upper or middle class, which immediately makes it suspect. I remember my first show in London, and a large, hairy, and rather threatening individual came in. I was alone. What's all this middle class shit, he says, as he loomed over me. And I was too middle class, in fact, to tell him to F off. And if he didn't, I called the police. I like to think I would have done so, but he, had, he did that off of his own account. But my work, where did class come into it? So now we get to about me. At about seven years old, I wanted to be an artist. Unlike it, I knew what that was, but I drew obsessively. I had a very messed up education with a constant change of schools and countries. At the last school, which was at least respectful, I asked to be moved up a form and crammed in as many O-levels into a year as I could, and I went to an art school, St. Martin's in London, at not quite 16. In 1954, it was a four-year course. The first year concentrated on drawing skills. The second was labeled intermediate with an exam at the end, and you had to go absolutely everything, sculpture, clay modeling, so-called commercial art. I can't remember what I was supposed to do with that, but I was no good at it then years three and four in which you specialized. I could draw fairly well. I needed to earn a living. Thought I'd be no good at teaching, didn't want to. So I started the illustration course, having been advised that I'd be okay. And this I understood was the beginning of artistic ruin. <laughs> but that first year was a re revelation. I had no, had no real tuition in drawing, I just drew. No one had shown me how to measure, above all the spaces in between, nor had I learned anything about the laws of perspective. We drew from class to class, bits of Michelangelo's, David, Roman goddesses, cheaper obviously than hiring a model every day, but also useful. Objects were piled up, and I particularly remember a cartwheel, so much more 
complicated than I had thought and very odd perspective, which inspired real respect for the real life. We were also taken out in groups to draw the world around us, in our case London, townscape, the river, everything. Large drawing, I discovered to my surprise, was much more interesting if the model wasn't a young and beautiful person. The lines, the savvy bits were good to draw. And I still remember Marjorie, who came with many props. She often arranged herself on a scruffy Victoria chaiselon, which she draped with scarves. The combs in her hair and bracelets and necklaces. She was a hippie before her time, and she could hold a pose. We were allowed to spend a half day on one pose, and then after lunch a second. Occasionally, it was a whole day. I have sat for a class. I earn money some evenings, but I didn't have a class to go to, and I can assure you, it's agony. Even with a break every hour, I don't know how the good ones did it. We had to draw short poses too, but I was hopeless. I still need time to really see and analyze what I'm drawing, and I think this is important. Quick poses can produce lively results, but there is a need to look and look and look again to understand how the body works, and don't forget Grey's anatomy. In my first year in illustration, I was very lucky. There were many dropouts, leaving only seven in my year group. The department head took an interest, and when my modest graph was cut, why was I in London? I should go to Guildford, my local art school. He said that Guildford would do me no good, and that I required what St. Martin's could teach me. I was to take no notice, and he would sort it all out. Incidentally, when I went to my first interview at St. Martin's, aged 15 and a half, with a collection of terrible drawings of nude ladies consumed by fire, dragons with ladies, trapeze artists, and God knows what else, hardly any men. We didn't see many men in English boarding school. The head of the time, Edward Morse, was very kind, and among his words of advice was that I needed to learn to find the dragon in everyday things, including the dustbin. I never painted the dustbin, preferring objects with more aesthetic interest to start with, but I've never forgot that. I've never forget, forgotten that very sound advice, and surprisingly enough, I did understand it at the time. So, two years trying to be an illustrator passed very quickly. I did well enough, but remember crying my eyes out when I realized that I had to leave and start a normal life. It had been a wonderfully protective and all embracing environment, full time for four years and at least two evening classes a week. Enough concentration on the basics to be a springboard. Though I did learn that being a drawer could be a problem. We few illustrators, all girls, were part of a group invited to draw and paint in the grounds of a nice hotel in Buxton, Derbyshire, then board paid. The painters said they wouldn't go if there were any illustrators included. Like bullied children, meekly and foolishly we gave in, and a lot of the painters were much older, they'd done national service, which might explain the tutors' inability or unwillingness to confront them. We were a group of girls and sexism was right. So the prejudice was quite strong even then, even then against those of us who naturally draw in both senses from the natural world around us, and in fact found what might be described as inspiration from it. But there was a problem which was that of size and scale. To be an illustrator, you were limited to small scale works. Being a natural fiddler, I didn't think too much about that then. And in spite of financial crises and ups and downs, some stuff I can look back on as okay. A lot makes me cringe. I wasn't very good, but there were people worse than me, so I got by. I did all kinds of things to push out my income. I did some very well paid cooking, which I fell into by accident. Basically, the proper cook was drunk, and some desperate person thought I could do it, and I was sent to a city bank to feed directors. They liked what I did, and I got asked back occasionally. I got expensive leftovers, which fed us for a couple of days, and these I'd share with the butler of the day. In one place, there were two dining rooms, managers and directors, four butlers and a kitchen maid. I honestly don't know how I did it. But they sent up the cook's gin ration, and at the end of the week, I had a whole bottle. And I also sold stuff at exhibitions, double shifts when I was allowed. And at one, I built mini battleships from bits of plastic. I did office cleaning, but I was bad at it and wasn't asked bad. A year after leaving St. Martin's, having improved my portfolio, I got taken on by decent agents and started my apprenticeship in illustration. After a while, they suggested that they kept me on for good one-off jobs with an eye to the American market, which was well paid then. 
that and that kept me off the treadmill of really badly paid illustration work. My developing feeling for the natural world led to 12 paintings the months of the year for collectors' plates, popular in the USA at the time. My capacity for fiddle was useful, mostly O and double O brushes were needed. The job was to me fantastically well paid and was a protection against inevitable fallow periods. I worked very long hours during those illustration years. I've never been a natural, and I've had to struggle. When I was about 40, I met an Italian landscape painter who said the magic words, don't you think that the energy that goes into those little images would go into something larger and more interesting? I replied that it might be so, but I had no idea how I could change. I knew nothing about the painting world, had no concepts and other excuses. He amazingly said, that if I could take some time out and do 40 images, he would find me somewhere to have a show in Italy. So I produced 40 images in acrylic, and some of them really bad, and we broke them down, and we were renting a room in an old courtyard with no proper lavatory for 80 pounds a year. And we stayed a couple of months in the summer. I sold just enough to make me feel there was a possible future. In a very haphazard way, I did bits of illustration, slowly negotiating my way into painting in oils and did some etching. The process of etching I liked, the printing I learned, but I got by. I was picked up painting in Venice. I was staying with a friend by a nice old lady who wanted me to meet her husband. I went to tea and took my husband, and they were sorry we had no noble blood. This meeting led to a house sit for several summers while we were out of Venice to escape heat. I would go out and help get them packed up and off to the country. I held the fort in the palazzo, watered plants, fed goldfish, and worked very hard. I'm not a natural painter of architecture, but it was there and so was I. In the end, of course, it all fell apart. They were very old and dementia was setting in. One year I found the kitchen cupboards had been taped up. They asked me to sleep on the floor below where their son normally lived, and I found that the fridge was locked. Considerable negotiation got me my pr fridge, but it was not a good situation. But my friend across the square, if you know Venice, San Giovanni, Paolo, um, had come back from a holiday. I told her the tale, also that I was accused of running up phone bills. Out, she said. I must clean up, I said. Okay, she said. At about 2 a.m., she and her daughter fetched me and my luggage, and I thought Fuga met Sonotti as we passed the Colleone statue where Casanova used to meet his nun lover, M.M. But I learned a lot about light, painting little Venice pictures, and again, I sold enough to make it just about worthwhile. I learned Italian, and since I later became a director of a small literary publishing company, Didalus, I read Italian novels for them. The next thing was concentrating on English landscape, Kent mostly. I could get somewhere nice and paintable in Kent in a quarter of an hour and a quarter if I left before the traffic. And this sort of thing is hard going physically. You have three windows of time, painting one, painting two, and painting three. You can start blocking them off and going over time. But once you have a fix of shadows, etc., your time window shrinks. The midday jobs simply may not work out. They are the hardest. You will also, of course, have to take note of the weather. You need, a few good, you need a few days of good enough weather. You are not a camera. You are trying for some sort of synthesis of time and place, and it will change all the time. The sky, the sky will be running past you, and if you arrive and there's a nice sky, paint it first. You can always do it again if the better one turns up. And of course, there are those very fast workers, and I am not one of them, who go out and create a perfectly acceptable piece of work in the morning. <coughs> My Italian friend was one of those. He said if he was not fresh, he was nothing. He could be perfunctory, vulgar even, but he could also produce work of real quality. My reply was that I didn't have that ability and needed to return several times, that my approach was more contemplative, if you like, and he didn't like. You had to agree with him. I kept going as an illustrator with other American jobs. I was painting, odd things came my way, step by step, how to do it, pieces for art, part works, and the work photographed as it progressed, nerve wracking, but the money wasn't bad, and there was a how to paint landscape book. I also had a commission for two big paintings in a fine old London house. One was seven foot long, and I worked on it on and off for nearly two years. They were imaginative 
pieces, but they were based on nature and drew on my experiences in illustrating. We moved to South East London in 1985 to a decrepit Georgian house with a long garden. I had been well, so as it developed, I started painting it. Now it's said to be one of the best rose gardens in South London and earns money for charity by the National Garden Scheme. And we have Japanese tourists. Um, painting the garden is very difficult. It's much more difficult than landscape. It took me a long time to get the hang of it, but I had a nice gallery at the time, and a few sold, enough to be encouraging. I also painted still life, very tricky, and the many who sneer at flower painting simply do not know anything about it. The wretched things never stop moving. And you do have to remember, and I'll quote my old Italian friend Bruno again, you have to be a little in love with your subject, or how can you hope to inspire the wish to possess it in its translated into faint form? <coughs> So this is what I do. I try to translate what I see into that synthesis, which is a painting, which resembles, but is in no way a totally realistic version of what I see. I wish I could offer more practical, helpful hints for anyone interested. I can only say, do all you can to develop your eye. There are lots of books on color and art magazines. I'm not sure how good the internet is on this, but there are books um, and the art magazine is surprisingly good, which will also include paint and mixing. I'm not good at all that technical stuff. My eyes tell me what I need. I mix the paint on the palette and it seems to work. There is a sort of oil painting rule which is fat over lean and that works for me. I mostly work on hardboard rather than canvas, which I primed with commercial acrylic primer. The reason for choosing board is that it's firm, doesn't flap about in the wind, and more importantly, if you've made a mistake in how you place the subject, you can cut and you can trim to size for a frame. However, over a certain size, it gets too heavy. I used to use lake cream as a dryer, and it is good, but I've sort of cleaned myself off it, and I mostly just use curves. There are lots of how-to books describing all kinds of techniques and methods, but your own instinct should tell you what's right for you. I do lots of things that are wrong. And with the next piece of work, I'll try and discipline myself. I might be surprised. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. Right, if you want to ask me anything, I will do my best to answer it. <laughs> Illustration day is at a itself to you as, I think, a completed thing. 
there's no reason why, if you want to, you can't say, but I prefer another ending, or I'd like to take her out of this and shove her somewhere else, and whatever, which is, which is different. But a good novel is still a good novel. Um, and I don't think any kind, I don't think the um, technology, there is enough technology for it to have had a very big influence if it was required. I think you will find that most people who are writing are writing because they wish to get something out of their system, it's a part of their life, or they've had this idea for years, or whatever it is. Um, and it doesn't need um, the, the, except for you know the extremely useful um, ability to uh, do it do it on the screen and correct as you go and all the rest of it and print it out, look at it and so on. Um, I think it is different. Um, as for uh, technology and art, well, it's you, you know, it's another aspect, isn't it? I mean, you can use the technology, and it's um, it's there for you. It's just that, you know, I'm I'm not saying don't do this or don't do that. I what I'm saying is that there are people like me who are sort of, you know, as I say, possibly genetic, um, you know, who who have this instinct to do a certain kind of thing. Um, that there is a tendency to say, oh, well, don't do that. And I did actually hear a story of a young woman who was actually rather, um, rather good, you know, technically, and what she was doing was quite interesting. And the um, a tutor come, came in and said, don't do that. Well, actually, that's not what art school is for. If somebody is working, working, producing something, an image which they wish to elaborate on, do several versions of, for whatever reason. That's all part of the development process. Um, <coughs> so I think, you know, technology, yes, but there's other stuff. Does that? Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. Thank you. <laughs> I just was sort of, yeah. No, no. Was the technology isn't easy. No, 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 I'm not saying it's easy, but it's certainly not. Um, you can, a lot of a lot of, I mean, you know, children are very good at, at, at technology and they learn to do it. And they're certainly not, not developing over five years generally to do artwork, is my saying. That it is the, I think it is, I'm not absolutely sure about this, but I think it is something to do with the, the artist or the creator and, or whatever, and the, um, the image and there's this thing going to and fro, you know, between you and it, and sometimes it wins and you can't do a darn thing with it, and sometimes you can impose yourself and it's okay. Um, and I, there doesn't seem to be any, um, there doesn't seem to be any reason why some things work and some things don't. You know, it's just like that. <laughs> okay. um, does anybody have a question? I have a quick question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you mentioned the dragon. Oh yes, I like dragons. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought it was a very good thing to say to me. Yes. At Fifteen and a half. I think it's a good thing to say even now. Yes. At the age of whatever, twenty-seven. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I'm wondering, when you choose your subjects to paint, yeah, is it because you find the dragon? Like, how do you know when you're looking at something that? No, I'm not going to make that. You, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. Oh well, I'll tell you. I mean, you know, landscape particularly. Um, you know, in what used to be a sort of rather terrible old car, I would drive round the Kent countryside, <laughs> whimpering slightly to myself, <laughs> looking at things, trying to see something which sparked me off. And I do remember one particular. Um, place where I could see it, I knew it, but could I find it? No, I couldn't. I parked the car, I walked up and down and around, then I went into the ditch, and that was it. You know, the dragon was there. And there is, it is that sparking off thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why often um, commissioned pieces are so difficult, because you've got to, you really do have to find the dragon. Like, um, 
sometimes people want you to paint their house in a, man, in a landscape kind of thing, and that can be really, really bad, and it's better not to do it, really, unless you can walk round and round and round and round, and some of you think, yeah, the light's right, this is right, this would actually work, and I've done a couple of those. But um, it is, there has to be some sort of spark. As old Bruno said, you know, you've got to be a little bit in love with your subject. There's got to be something there. The other question I had um, was that really there were, I saw four sort of different, let's say, styles in a certain sense, or four different ways of catching the dragon, as it were. And, 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 and with illustration, you don't necessarily catch it anywhere. I mean, you're trying, you're doing a job, you hope, you know, you. you know, yeah, there's a certain kind of, let me put like this, there was a certain kind of muscularity or a certain kind of, I don't know, passion energy that I saw in some of the drawings, in most of the drawings, in fact, I would say the drawings. Um, but I thought there was a very real difference between the paintings that you did of, let's say, Venice, mm -hmm. and the paintings of the garden. Do you consider those at all similar or, or exactly the same? They struck me as very different mm -hmm. types of work. Well, they are. Yes, and I mean, can you elaborate on why they are different? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I know that some of them weren't finished, or yeah, well, I think the whole thing about Venice is that it's, I mean, many, many people have done it, and they've done it very, very, very well. And I was, you know, um, not experienced. Uh, you know, you sort of wandered around looking, looking, looking for a place where you could actually, that you could work from as well, physically. Um, and so, well, I, I think it was, a, I, I say, I think, in this, that it was there and so was I. And mm -hmm. I think it was, I felt it was a good thing to do. Well, I mean, let me put it like this. In the garden, in many of the garden images, or images in the book, uh, paintings, um, the use of white mm -hmm. is, is really bold. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a lot of layering. In, yeah. you, you can even see it, even though it's a slide. Yeah. You can see that there's this kind of what, what I would call a muscularity or mm -hmm. kind of yeah. Yeah. something. Yeah. And in the Venice one, A, there was no white or very little. I didn't notice it. I mean, it might be white to make the brown lighter or something yeah, like that. Yeah. It wasn't really white, white. And I find white is such an odd mm -hmm. thing to use. It's a very, mm -hmm. it's a very difficult non-color. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So I'm just curious about that. I really don't know. I mean. I suppose you can say that um, compared with um, people who go to art school today, or the rest of it, I'm, I, I really was um, much more of a doer than a thinker I had, and still had no real concept. I mean, whatever it is, but, well, I do what I do. It's what I do, it's what I am, it's my life. Justify, I can't, it's bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It's bonkers, you know. I mean, I'm quite intelligent enough to have done something that might have given me a higher standard of living for the rest of it. As it is, we, as you know, we have certain low coming and we're all right. But, um, you know, if you are in, in arts and letters, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, I'm kind of like follow up. To yeah. I found it always, and I, I don't paint anymore. <laughs> yeah. Painted since I painted, but I always found it. My my hand. You, you talk about eye co uh, hand contact. Yeah. I was learning a lot about it when I was growing up and yeah. going to drawing classes and yeah. trying. That was what I understood to be an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Failing my exams to art school because of painting of still life. But <laughs> <laughs> so you're not sympathetic to still life. <laughs> But, well, it's but very difficult. Yes. Murderous. Yeah, uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I fall from that to get that. But uh, what it was, uh, I found that the, the connection, I had connection, depending on the subject, it changes. Uh, the, the movement of the hand, the kind of. Oh, yeah. When, yeah, yeah, when yeah. you do, and ah. it's somehow automa like it's out automatic. You don't really control after, it. As much. You after a certain amount it. of time. Ah. Yeah. Then later you probably realize and you make it a technique of some sort. But mm. on the beginning, it's kind of 
natural things. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. That's I identify in those because oh. I realize the same thing that the, yeah. the, the layered yes. flowers in the garden and the kind of free paint, kind of lighter, much more lighter touch of the architectural. Yeah. yeah. I don't honestly think. Um, I think the architectural stuff, I regard it as a challenge, um, and I, I did it, and I was aware of the, the whole light aspect in Venice, but don't forget, you know, if you're in Venice for painting art tours, you've immediately got ten people standing behind you, and probably one in front. Um, <laughs> You know, the number of times I said to somebody, you're not transparent, you know. Um, <laughs> and, but I, I think I did it, well, it, it was kind of, it was a door. Somebody opened a door and I walked through it. Um, and if I had been a really good painter of architecture, I would have taken it further, but I wasn't. You know, it was just something, something I did. But the hand-eye con connection thing is, is, I think it's just something that, the better you can be at it, the more control you've got. And um, you know, that, that control you can then, with the control, you can loosen. But if you haven't got the control in the, in the first place, you can be as loose as you like, and it may be loose in the wrong place for you. I mean, you know, there are people who would just go, and my old friend Bruno used to, I mean, he was extraordinary. He could do the most awful things. I mean, vulgarity wasn't he. But he could also just get it right. And that was really something to admire. Um, now, I, I can't do that. As I say, I have to be, there's a sort of contemplative thing that I have to live with it and work at it and fight it. Um, and that's, that's where the layering comes in, you know, because it, you know, it was very often not, not what I wanted to do and got that far with it. I'll just go on, just scrape a bit off and go on. Um, I suppose, for me, it's always a battle. Um, I'm not a natural. I've never been a natural. Um, and some people are. You know? And sometimes that can be wonderful. And sometimes being a natural can actually almost be against you because you are so fluid, so, so slick. I have to work really, really hard on making it not look um, sort of overworked, you know, trying to get a sort of, I can work quite hard on trying to look easy, <laughs> and it never is, ever. Um, I mean, I can't justify what I do. <laughs> Could you say just? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to ask about the size of the pictures, because it wasn't obvious that oh, right, right they there. Are. And just what, what, what range of sizes? The gardens tend to be about like that, because you've got a, um, basically, you are either standing or sitting, and you've got to get around it, you've got to see. And um, if you have a really big painting, and sometimes I do that, and you're looking over the top, you're looking around the side, you're going, you know, and working on this bit and moving the thing, and then the light's gone. You know, and, and it's, it, it, it's, uh, th there is sort of a limit, and that's why I was always so impressed by the pre Raphaelites dragging those enormous ray houses outside, <laughs> you know, and fiddling around with dandelions and can't knows what else, you know, um, and getting that right, and then coming in and, you know, Poor Elizabeth Siddle in the bathtub, and <laughs> I mean, no wonder she expired from consumption. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, they were uh, pretty amazing, really, whether you like them or not. Um, but they appeared as much bigger paintings, because I, I, I Mine. yes, the sorry, um, the uh, garden paintings. Well, I was some of them, them you know, I mean, I'd They're say a bigger than like. Yeah like that, like that. I seldom go more than in width. About four foot, four foot wide, you know, and then whatever it is up, you know, if you it. Sometimes they're very landscapey, sort of getting right across. But um, it is to do with management, actual physical management of them. And, um, I'm sort of trying to think. 
I mean, I've done, I've done bigger paintings. The two um, paintings I uh, said I took very long time <coughs> of, uh, for, um, which were commissioned, and uh, one of them was seven foot long, and it was very, very fiddly. I and mean, it was ridiculous thing to do, really. It didn't make sense. But it's quite a good painting. I, I wasn't able to photocopy it because it's so big and it's and it's varnished. Um, fortunately, I know the people who have it, and I still do. Um, but really, to photograph it, it would require a very expensive specialist to do it. Yeah. So part of your process <coughs> um, of making the so the garden paintings. Do you, do you do some highly sort of detailed drawings? No, no, I just the drag the thing out. I just drag the board out on an easel and start. <laughs> no drawing. Well, I mean, a little bit of, you know, a bit of. I start off with prepared, um, prepared board. It's white, mm. so I do a little bit of scruffy, um, pale green, pale green paint. You know, diluted in. Um, in in turfs to just get a kind of the rough thingy so I know really vaguely what I'm doing and I'm on the shadows um, you know for mm. however long I can stay with it um, and, and then you know in it, it's just your strengths as an illustrator right? I, I could imagine you would make or would have made Incredible, beautiful sort of drawings that would yeah, inform. No, no, it doesn't work. But it's process. different. It's different. Yeah. I mean, painting is. That was why I found it so hard to get to go from illustration into painting much bigger things because I had been going pick, 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 fiddle, 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 <laughs> um, and I swear never again. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could have brought. A, I, I don't have. Um, appropriate images of the American plates, but I mean, it, I still don't know how I did it. I mean, it was, I, I think the first one took me nearly a month, and then the second one was three weeks, and then I got it down. It was 12, the 12 months of the year, and uh, I got better at it, but, you know, <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> I think that's the best thing you can say, and it played me very. Well, and it got me through a very long time. You know. mm. um, funnily enough, they turned up the the originals turned up on the internet a few years ago for sale. So whether the um, I don't know what happened to the firm. It was one of these things where they were very um, very popular, and some of them were truly horrible. I'll say that mine were bad. Um, <laughs> no, but what happened was very funny. There was a my agents also agented for a very good watercolors called S.R. Badman. He was good. And he was old. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> the American company said, did they think that he would live long to complete these plays? <laughs> and they said, well, they couldn't tell. <laughs> but they had an artist who they thought might live. So <laughs> So I did the 12 and he did the four seasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all there is. Yeah, sorry. Henry? Yeah, no, I just wanted to go back to the point about drawing because you seem to have uh, um, a being your body for the drawing. Um, and I could, I could say that from my experience of art school, it, the, the art school I went to was Edinburgh. Yes. Uh, Edinburgh. It was the tyranny of light drawing. Uh, <laughs> the, you said the, the, the tyranny. tyranny. Oh, the tyranny. Yes. yes. Of light drawing. Yeah. Where it was almost like a boot camp, where you would have to draw two days a week, and there would be evenings where you had to do head life yeah. drawings. Um, and then at the end of the second year, you had an anatomy exam. Yeah. Where you had to know everything about every muscle. In oh the no, body. they didn't do that to us. Okay, <laughs> so, but you know, you see, and, and I think that's, and, and for me, in a perverse way, I kind of like doing that. Mm -hmm. So that worked for me, but for so many people, it yeah. did not work for them, yeah. because they couldn't do that. Yeah. They were very good at drawing chairs, or they were very good at doing other things, but life model, life drawing was the mantra. They couldn't do it. Yeah. So it didn't kind of speak to their skills, basically. No, no. But and I, mean, I think the 
effect. The big problem is this notion that it is somehow the drawing of anatomy is what is prioritized as valuable within the last school. When I don't think it's about the drawing of anatomy, I think it's about the anatomy of drawing. Yes, and I think I, that's I, what I we really are meant to look at because the 20th century has a wide, yes. wide history yes. of different kinds of yes. making through yeah. drawing yeah. and different ways of understanding drawing. Yeah. And there's no reason why we should prioritise that over what the surrealists do with automatic drawing or any of these other kinds of genres or disciplines. Yeah. I, so, I, did, I did say, don't forget, that it shouldn't only be life drawing. And I think using life drawing as, as a tyranny is absolutely wrong. I mean, the, the useful thing about life drawing, if, if you're any good at it and you like it, is that everybody can see whether you have managed to have, be able to be accurate with it because, you know, because, because, because. Um, and it's harder to, um, you, you know, we're talking about when you start, when you're yeah, a young yeah. student. Well, I, I, I think it's it. difficult to, to, to kind of just draw anyway. Yeah, mm. you know, but we also I, I don't, have It doesn't these... really matter what it is that we are drawing. Yeah. I think it's difficult to kind of... Yeah. Think. But I think we always, you know, because here, there was a point when we arrived here many years ago, where um, there was life drawing all the time. Mm -hmm. And they got to the point where we'd have a model sitting, <laughs> reading, reading a book or the newspaper, <laughs> and nobody would turn up no. because nobody really wanted to be involved. Yeah. Huh. And so it's, I think what happens in our schools now is that it's very much about how the students drive what they want. Yeah. There's a, there's a great diversity. As opposed to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my my point about drawing is, well. Forever, that that if you can do, um, if you can develop your hand and your eyes sufficiently to be able to do, make what you want to do out of what you see in front of you, you are then you are then slightly better equipped. But if you don't want to do light drawing, if you don't want to do drawing based work, then that I've got nothing against that. What I am against is the idea that somehow uh, you shouldn't want to do. You know, you know, basically, it's that you shouldn't want to be me. I mean, you know, no, 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 there should, be a, stupid, there should be a place for everyone. There, there, there needs absolutely to be. Absolutely, should be a place for everyone. Yeah. And I draw. I love drawing. I make lots of drawing. Yeah. Um, but I don't. I, I kind of. I think you. One must always play to people's strengths. Yes. And, and that's the important thing that some people are. Like you, I have friends who, um, one very good friend who, um, when we were at art school, could make a life painting in 20 minutes and everybody would be struggling like yes, mad. And yes, going, yes. How do you do this? Yes. And you know, yes. he kind of taught himself yes. this yes. man on a piano concerto in D minor. Yes, yes. So he's and this kind of natural genius. Yes. But the thing that he couldn't do was conceptualise. Yes. Mm. Well, the thing is, did in he different want ways, to? he could draw from life and that and point of reference, and that was fine. But to make that into something else that was more meaningful in terms of what the practice was about, he could not do that. Yes, but he didn't. My point is that you shouldn't be forced. I have no concept at all beyond the fact that I am a sort of physical being that, for some reason or other, as a very small child started doing what I do already, I do, do now, and I do it better now than I did then. But that was what I wanted to do. The, the concept as such never occurred to me. Um, I simply was instinctive in what I did. Now, you can say that's bad, you can say that's good, but I don't see why the conceptual should be forced if it isn't there, any more than life drawing should be forced if it isn't there. My point is, that you should not exclude, you should not educate a child or a young person out of what they are best at doing. I mean, I, what I hear you saying, apart from just what you just said, uh, was that there is a skill in being an artist. There's actually a skill. Well, then yeah. they only, it, it, it no, depends no, but if you're a conceptualist. Then, you know. But there's a skill in being a 
conceptuals too. Yes, I mean, the goal yes, skill you know, there's a skill, the and that, form. and that, as a result, there's a way in which one can say, not so much this is uh, this is bad art because I personally don't like it, but because yeah. it doesn't work. You know, it's like you know. In other words, um, it's not just you know whoever is in the boardroom or whoever you've slept with or whoever you know can put your paintings up somewhere. It's how you get into a gallery. Although that is part of the art world game, but it's also sometimes work is just terrible, and you need to. And that there's a skill involved in it, whatever this is, you know, yeah. whatever. The, yeah. And what I appreciated about what you were talking about was that you were demanding that that skill be recognized. Um, I'm not demanding, no. <laughs> I am saying that the business of an art school should not be to educate whatever it is, the ins that instinctive wish, like the, Henry. the painter Henry um, referred to, to educate that out of him in order to turn the student, her or him, I don't know, I think it was him, to educate that ability, that feeling, the response. And again, I think I say something about the response, you know, that we, we um, connection. Mm -hmm. It's connection. But to me, if someone is, you know, being, like I, I started out as a lefty, and then I am now writing with my right hand, because I, when I went to school, you weren't allowed to write with your left hand. You know, the, yeah. you had to, like, you know, learn how to write with your right hand. But, um, what, what I'm saying is is that uh, that to me, I wasn't educated to work with my right hand. I was forced. I was forced. I was traumatized. You know, yes. I had to run. Yes. And to me, I wouldn't use that term, educate someone in a different direction. I think that, you know, there are skills that people learn, just like you're saying, you know, yeah. if you're going to be a dancer, then, yeah. you know, you've got to learn how to do it. You just can't just jump on the stage and become, yeah. you know, the ballerina or whatever. All pick up the yeah, and yeah. the violin and all the rest. That, that there's an actual skill. Yeah. And these skills, that's what the education is. It's the education isn't about like, you know, chopping off the, the hand so they can all be right handed. It's rather that and, and for those kind of environments, I think that that's what one does either with conceptual or with life drawing, whatever. That to me is a problem. You know, and in fact, I mean, I say this as a philosopher, there's so many philosophers uh, and theorists in the world who actually think that you have a model of how to think, and then you apply that model to something. Mm -hmm. And that is so far away from philosophy, from thinking, from anything. It has nothing to do with it. It's just bad philosophy, mm -hmm. or it's bad theory, or it's bad concept, or something like that. It's just like, mm -hmm. you know. I, th I think, you know, you sort of come back to the fact that you're a human being. You are not, you're, you, you, you're, you're not a sort of, you're not a construct, you're a human being, and you develop the way a human being does for whatever reasons, upbringing, you know, all the rest of it, you know. And, and it just seems to me that at the moment, well, ad infinitum would say it, you know, that, that the, um, the, edu the art educational establishment is still very, wary and essentially dismissive of people who want to do what I do. And what I'm saying is that there are an awful lot of people like me who've managed somehow to stick to their guns. Um, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't really be such a sweat. You shouldn't have to fight as hard. But I don't think, I mean, I think that Central St. Martin's or the, the, the course outline that you downloaded or whatever that you saw, you referred to, I, I think that that, I, I would be careful to, to look at that and then say that's what's happening in the art establishment. Because in schools like this, for example, that's not happening. No. You know, and it's not happening, I mean, it might be happening in places like uh, Slade, for example, um, or even in the Royal, uh, Royal College of Arts sometimes. You know, there are places that, you know, have reputations, I don't know why they have them. Mm. Yeah, 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 right. I just wanted to second that, because one of the reasons I wanted to come in is, you know, Henry at my interview said that as long as people have a practice, we're here to accommodate whatever, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. it's been true, it's true. It doesn't work Wonderful. if you see yeah. group tutorial after group yeah. tutorial, you know, it's been yeah. so diverse and so yeah. Yeah. 
welcome and, and, yeah. and everybody's been so supportive. Yeah. And students and tutors alike are terrific. It's, it's terrific. Yeah. I mean, I was, I think I was very lucky because, first of all, um, when I went to art school, I was the right student for that place, however young I was. But they were also, you know, there was a certain amount of hand bringing in the day, and you, know, you don't have a sense of design, do you? No. Um. <laughs> I think, I think you, if you started this MA, you know, in September, you'd, you'd be, you'd be accommodated and, and loved, to, to, honestly, and and and. So you didn't know that you were going to start an MA here, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know you don't. I know you don't. But you get my point. Yes, I do. It's quite unusual, I guess. I mean, yes. Sarah, what were you going to say? No, I just, because I had an experience. I was at art school sort of 12 years ago. And I was just thinking how maybe it's the students that have the preconception rather than the, the tutors, actually. Because I, I remember quite a few of my peer group yeah. came to me. Sarah, people don't draw. You know, people don't. Yes. I actually oh, had well, that. Yes. Study. People don't draw, and I was like, yeah. How yeah. could that? Yes. So I just hid away. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. But it was actually said to me. Yes. You can do yes. photography. You can do film. Yeah. That's what people do. Yeah. So well, that's maybe maybe the way there's way things move as well. Yeah. yeah. You know that maybe at that time. That was the, the big cheese was photography and film, and it still is, but everything else is coming yeah. kind of yeah. back in, maybe. I mean, I think in that case, I, I think you are very lucky to be in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I, I mean, I... Well, in, in, in the, you know, there's a course in Wimbledon, isn't there, which is a course in drawing. So that's where I was studying. Yeah. Whole, and now, yes. Whereas, Henry, a friend of mine who went to Wimbledon, said very much what you said about Wimbledon, was incredibly difficult to not go along with the mores of the place, you know, and you've got to, I don't know whether they lock them up and need life from them, and, you know, <laughs> but, but it just does seem to me that there does need to be room for most sorts of, you use the word practice. Well, I think, I think lots, you know, I think lots of people are doers. Yeah. Um, and work and, and learn through that doing process. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then when we're talking about things being conceptual, I think all work is conceptual. I don't mean conceptualism as a kind of grouping or group. I think all work has some kind of conceptual background to it, regardless of what we're doing. And you know, in a way, you could say that you're having a, you're you're making a kind of intuitive response to the gap and mm -hmm. working there. But in terms of how you organise that, and, and, and you do, you compose, you organise colours, there's a lot of structure in what you do, you're kind of, it's, it's conceptual, you know, it's conceptually defined in, in terms of how you After it, it operates. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I don't think it's after, I think it's through the process that it emerges. And we could say that that's maybe, in one sense, it does a gut response to certain things and it's intuitive, but but that's based on all your experience. Intuition's based on all your experience. Yes, that's true. You know, and it kind of yeah. comes through in that way. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I don't, you know, I think it's much more kind of complex yeah. than, than simply, I'm just a doer. Well, I, you know, it's very, it's very, very difficult, isn't it, to be able to stand back from what you do um, and sort of talk about it in the abstract. Uh, I mean, it is. I have well, these to guys say. all know that because they've just had to do it. So. Yeah, it's been the last couple hours, just before you talk, yeah, I'm doing it. But it is an instinct. It, it has been in my life. It's an instinctive thing. I wanted to do it. Yeah. I wanted to do it, and I would do things to, uh, to, 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 to keep my fixes going, you know, the habit, whatever. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's, I, I think that this is a good note to end on and to uh, reconvene in a pub. If you want. Um, and I want to thank you, Luna. I think it was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
want to talk to Lynette before we vacate the premises? Okay. Okay. Thank you.